10.30, so I think we'll get started. Good morning. Thank you for tuning in. Today is September 17th. It's the date we selected to do our online faculty preview of the new Supreme Court term. It also happens to be Constitution Day, which commemorates the creation and signing of the Constitution. We are delighted that our program happened to come together on this day. I am Mary Allen, the Public Relations Officer for both campuses of Widener Law, and I'm coming to you from the Ruby R. Vale Moot Courtroom on our Delaware campus. Delaware is the first state, of course, to ratify the Constitution. In addition to Delaware, we are also live from our campus in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This event is intended for the media and all friends of Widener Law. It is the sixth year we've done the preview and the second we've done it in this online format. I'm excited to introduce you to several faculty members who are participating for the first time this year. The professors will speak first, then take questions. This is an outstanding opportunity to ask them questions about these cases, and you may submit questions through the Q&A box on your screen. Also, you can track what's happening next with our agenda via the notes box. We'll be hearing from seven professors today who will each take about five minutes to preview their cases. We have two professors who are handling multiple cases for us, so we're going to give them a little bit extra time. But we do intend to get through this in an hour. We're also posting contact information for the professors on screen slides for those of you who'd like to know how to follow up with them. We're recording the program, and it will be posted to our website soon. The school will tweet the link and post it to Facebook when it goes up. We're starting today with Professor Randy Lee, who's coming to us from Widener Law's campus in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and who actually has two cases for us. Both cases present interesting constitutional questions with themes of religious freedom. After Professor Lee, our cameras will turn to the Delaware campus for more presentations. Good morning, Professor Lee. Good morning, Mary. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. I understand you're going to start today with the case of Reed v. Town of Gilbert? I am. Thank you very much. Um, in Reed, the Town of Gilbert, Arizona, has an or ordinance regulating temporary signs. And under this ordinance, political signs can be up to 32 square feet. They can be displayed indefinitely, and they can be unlimited in number on a single property lot. Ideological signs can be up to 20 square feet, can be displayed again indefinitely, and are again unlimited in the number on a single property lot. But church signs inviting people to worship are considered, quote, qualifying event signs. And they may be just, they can be only six square feet, and they may be displayed for no more than 14 hours and are limited to four per property lot. Now, the township justifies this ordinance as an effort to promote traffic safety. As you mentioned, Mary, Reed versus Gilbert is a First Amendment case. It's, in fact, a free speech case, not a freedom of religion case. Um, and Reed versus Gilbert will come down to whether the town sign regulation is what's called content neutral or content based. In other words, does the way the signs are being treated under the regulation depend on what these signs say? Now, the government admit of Gilbert admits that its ordinance is dependent on category or effectively, in part, the sign's content. But the town of Gilbert insists that the categories are neutral and only respect the greater importance of some kinds of speech over others. The church, meanwhile, insists that the ordinance is not neutral, and it insists this for two reasons. First of all, um, the church insists that the ordinance distinguishes signs based on content, and then the church says that this, the ordinance makes a value judgment about which messages are more valuable than other messages. be free speech case rather than an exercise of religion case? Yeah, Mary, um, that's a great question. Um, 
And if you, you think about what's going on in the case, you can see this as the ordinance restricting the right of, of religion in the sense of restricting a church's ability to attempt to evangelize. Um, the reason that it's, it's a free speech case rather than a, a free exercise of religion case really, I think, comes down to a Supreme Court case from 1990, Employment Division versus Smith. And in Employment Division versus Smith, the United States Supreme Court was seen as restricting the extent that the freedom, of ex the freedom to exercise one's religion was protected under the Constitution. And because of this lessening of uh, free exercise of religion protection, a lot of the cases that would have traditionally been free exercise religion cases got shifted over by lawyers to be free speech cases. Holt I do. What can you tell us about that? Um, Holt versus Hobbs, I think, is the second case. And in this case, which is a case to be argued October 7th, um, an Arkansas prison regulation allows prisoners to grow a quarter inch beard um, for dermatological reasons. But the regulation would prohibit Gregory Holt or Abdul Malik Muhammad from growing a half-inch beard in response to the tenets of his, of his faith. And a half-inch is about the diameter of a dime. Now, Arkansas insists that this regulation is necessary for three reasons. First, it prevents inmates from hiding contraband like drugs, needles, or razor blades in their beards. Second, it prevents inmates who escape from prison from altering their appearance by shaving their beard and finally, it protects prison staff from being cut on sharp objects while searching a beard. Now, Mr. Holt is not challenging um, the prison regulation under the Constitution's free exercise of religion clause, but instead is challenging the regulation under a statute called ARLUPA, or the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Person Act. And our LUPA requires that when the government imposes a substantial burden on an inmate's religious practice, it must show that it has a compelling government interest for doing so, and its regulation represents the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. Um, when Arkansas was defending this um, regulation, um, Arkansas could not provide a single example of anyone being hurt by contraband hidden in a beard. In addition to that, 40 states and the federal government's Department of Corrections allow such beards as the one um, that Mr. Holt wants to have. And therefore, this case will probably come down to how much deference a Department of Corrections is entitled to when a court reviews their regulation. And to get your head around this, this notion of deference, it, you might go back to the classic line LeVar Burton used to use in Reading Rainbow. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, and, and how that, that ties in is if under our LUPA, courts have to take a state's word for what is compelling and necessary in a prison setting, then Arkansas should win this case. But if courts can decide for themselves what's compelling or necessary, they don't have to take the, the state's word, then Arkansas probably loses this case. So, Professor, why do you think this is coming up under our LUPA as opposed to under the Constitution itself? Mary, again, I think that, that's a very good question. And the reason, it, again, I think comes back to employment division versus Smith. Um, when the Supreme Court was perceived in Smith as cutting back the protections under the Free Exercise Clause, Congress responded by passing a couple of statutes that sought to expand religious protection as a statutory remedy as opposed to a constitutional remedy. And our LUPA was one of those statutes that responded. And so, again, a lot of your free exercise constitutional claims are shifting over to, um, for example, our LUPA to try and get the additional protection that the statute allows. So do you think there'll be any other religious cases accepted this term? Or are these, are these the only ones? Or what do you I, I think there's, a, there's at least two other areas where we could see um, the Supreme Court facing a, a, 
a free exercise of religion kind of an issue. Um, one is, I think, if you remember from the last term, we had the HHS um, contraception abort efficient um, health insurance mandates regulations come up. Those were the Hobby Lobby Conestoga um, Wood regulations. Um, I think a challenge to those regulations could appear again this term as applied to a different kind of organization, for example, a nonprofit or, or some kind of a religious ministry organization. Um, it's also possible that we haven't seen the last of Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Woods, and in some form those cases might find their way back up to the Supreme Court. Another case that, that I've been watching for a while that might finally have its, its day in the Supreme Court um, is a case called Bronx Household of Faith versus the Board of Education for the City of New York. And that case comes out of a policy by the Board of Education for the City of New York that the board will rent public school space during non-school hours for practically any purpose except for church worship services. And in fact, as the Second Circuit explains it, quote, schools are freely available for use by groups to express religious devotion through prayer, singing of hymns, preaching and teaching of scripture or doctrine. It is only the performance of a worship service that is excluded. Thus, the Board of Education will rent their schools to a church to pray, preach, and sing praise in so long as the church promises not to actually worship. Now, for fans of the Dickens novel Bleak House, Bronx household is kind of a John Dice versus John Dice kind of case. It has just gone on and on and on for 20 years. But it's possible this term, it could reach the Supreme Court as either a free exercise um, of religion or a free speech kind of case. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that roundup of cases. And Mary, thank you so much for having us and including us, and thank you especially for organizing this on such a significant day. Um, as a testament of what a hardworking professor you are, you're now off to teach class. So have a good class. I am. Thank you. And now our cameras will turn back to the Delaware campus, and we'll talk with some faculty here, beginning with Professor Jim May, who is sitting next to me. Professor May has a book coming out later this year about global environmental constitutionalism, but today he's got his eye on a case that involves social media with interesting free speech implications. And the, uh, the case title is Alonis versus United States. So Professor May, you want to take it away and tell us about that case? Yes, uh, thank you, Mary, and good morning, everyone, and happy Constitution Day. Um, the case that I'm going to talk about is about Facebook and the First Amendment. Uh, it's called Alanis versus the United States. And in this case, the Supreme Court has to consider whether in the extent to which intent and perception matter in making threats online. I will cover background, legal issues, some implications, and what happens next now. At bottom, the case concerns the important First Amendment question as to whether it's the subjective intent of the speaker that matters or whether what matters is the objective um, perception of the, uh, the person who receives a message. Starting with first principles, the First Amendment says that Congress shall not abridge the freedom of speech, but it hardly plays out the way it reads. The First Amendment does not protect all speech. There are exceptions for libel, incitement to violence, obscenity, and fighting words, and one for something known as true threats which is the issue in Mr. Alanis's case. Let me tell you about him. Anthony Alanis was a 26-year-old who lived with his wife and two small children in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and worked at nearby Dorney Amusement and Water Park. He had a single Facebook page under the pseudonym Dom de Rap of Tone Doogie. Tone Doogie had few Facebook friends. Anthony's wife, Tara, um, filed for divorce in 2010, and subsequently Anthony fell into a deep and dark state of despair. He then lost his job. He then began po posting a series of disturbing messages on his Facebook page. First, these were about his former employer, and then he <clears throat> moved on to his wife, police officers, a federal agent, and a nearby kindergarten. His language 
was laced with brutally violent images. He suggested that for Halloween, his son dressed in a costume that included his estranged wife's, quote, head on a stick. He talked about, quote, making a name for himself with a school shooting. His wife testified that she felt like she was being stalked. She was extremely afraid for her family and for her children, she testified. She took what he wrote as a true threat. So Anthony was convicted of violating a federal law in making this post, a federal law at 18 U.S.C. section 1875C, which makes it a crime to transmit in interstate commerce, quote, any communication containing any threat to injure the person of another. At trial, the district court rejected his request for a subjective intent standard. Anthony was convicted and sentenced to nearly four years of imprisonment. He challenged his conviction as unconstitutional, alleging that it didn't, what he wrote, didn't constitute a true threat under a case called Virginia versus Black. He claims that his subjective intent is what matters most. He said that he was just um, a, an aspiring rapper and that he was riffing in the style of Mar Marshall Mathers, known as Eminem, who early in his career in particular often coined lyrics about committing violent acts, including murder, including against his wife. Anthony says that he was also mimicking the style of other rappers who have lyrics that are far more lurid and violent. He claims he didn't actually threaten anyone, that he posted only on his Facebook page under a pseudonym, didn't post these messages anywhere else or provide links to them. For example, that there was no evidence that his son ever saw the postings. Moreover, he notes that several of the posts included express invocations of the First Amendment and the True Threat Doctrine and disclaimers and other, and other indications that he didn't mean anything by a true threat. Which brings us back to Virginia versus Black. In that case, in upholding a state statute, the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment does not protect cross-burning by those who know or have reason to know that their actions will intimidate. So Anthony interprets that as requiring a focus on subjective intent. Anthony is supported by several First Amendment groups. The government argues that a reasonable reader standard instead should apply. This case has wide implications. It is one of many recent prosecutions for alleged threats conveyed on new media, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Snapchat. So it is content or context that matters is the question. Context can be harder to gauge online than in person. And this case requires the justices to confront a new technology and assess the meaning of the First Amendment in the age of the emoticon. Oral arguments will occur this fall. Thank you. In the age of the emoticon, I like that. All right, I'm so sorry, I've got a couple questions here. for you. Can we take one? We appreciate the patience of everyone watching today when we've worked our way through that audio glitch. Professor May, thank you for your patience as well. I have a couple questions. Um, I wonder first, could a ruling that upholds an objective standard potentially subject anyone from demonstrative news anchors to hip-hop artists from federal criminal charges? Uh, terrific question. Thank you, Mary. Uh, yes, potentially this federal law could criminalize uh, statements that are made that are not intended as true threats, that are taken as true threat threats. Let me give you an example of, of a very simple one that came up this morning in my household. Um, just on my way here, my wife texted me a message saying, break a leg. Uh, so to her, naturally, I mean, that's her subjective intent is not to threaten me in any way. Of course, it's to encourage me. It's a common expression used, say, by those who uh, appear with performing arts. Uh, but if she had sent it accidentally to someone else, uh, they might have viewed it as being a true threat. And under federal law, uh, she would be subject to criminal prosecution um, for that. So that's the bottom line here. Is, does it matter how she intended the message, or does it matter how somebody might perceive it? I, I want to uh, invite everyone watching to feel free to submit questions through the Q&A box. And I've got one coming in here. Would a ruling that upholds a subjective standard just encourage online bullying and bad behavior? 
Um, right. That's the other side of the coin. It certainly could. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, if people could say, because one, one can always say that they didn't intend to threaten anybody and say the most heinous, worst possible things. So yes, it could encourage uh, that kind of bad behavior. So the bottom line question is whether there's ample room in the First Amendment um, to protect just that sort of behavior there. Thank you. All right, Professor May, thanks for being with us this morning. And now we're going to turn our attention to Professor Len Sasna. And for alumni and students and members of the media who've interviewed Professor Snasov before who are tuning in, you might be surprised to learn he's actually discussing a civil case this morning. Um, but juries and jury selection are at the heart of the case. So it has implications in the criminal arena as well. And we know, of course, he teaches criminal law and procedure here at Widener Law Delaware. So Professor Sosnov, you took a look at uh, Warger v. Showers, and I was hoping you could fill us in on what you found. Thank you. Uh, this case begins on a uh, highway in South Dakota. Uh, Gregory Warger is uh, riding his motorcycle down the highway, and Randy Showers is riding his big truck with a 28-foot camper attached to it. And they arrive at an intersection at the same time, and the camper clips the motorcycle. Uh, uh, Warger goes down, and he's hurt very seriously. Showers is fine. Uh, Warger is, hit, is hurt very seriously, including that his left leg had to be amputated. Um, he filed an action in district court uh, suing, claiming that Showers had negligently caused the accident and uh, chose to be tried by a jury. Uh, the jury selection was uh, unexceptional. The jurors were asked the typical questions about whether they could be fair and impartial in deciding the case, and whether they knew of any reason why they couldn't be fair to both sides of the case. All answered that they could be fair and impartial, and there was no reason that they couldn't be fair to both sides. The case proceeded through witnesses, and in the end, there was a verdict uh, in favor of Showers, the defendant with the truck. At that point, nothing uh, unexceptional about the case. Less than a week later, something happened which is unusual, though not unheard of. And that is that one of the jurors, uh, somewhat upset by what took place in the jury room, uh, came to the office of the uh, uh, Warger's attorney. Um, in other words, it wasn't contacted by Warger's attorney, uh, contacted the office, came in, and told Warger's attorney during deliberations the foreperson, a Mrs. Whipple, had said during deliberations that her daughter had once been the cause of a fatal accident, an automobile accident, and that if she had been sued, it would have ruined her life. And uh, a few jurors at that point uh, supposedly responded with concern for the defendant in the case, uh, Mr. Sowers, who was a young married man. And shortly after that, they returned a verdict in favor of Showers, the truck driver. Uh, the lawyer uh, got an affidavit from another juror. He had two affidavits, sworn affidavits from these jurors that this is what went on in the jury room. And he filed a motion for a new trial, uh, claiming that the comments of the fourth person, Mrs. Whipple, showed that she had been uh, dishonest during voir dire. And had given, if she'd given the true answers, it would have disqualified her for bias. Uh, the district court ruled that the evidence of her statements during deliberations were inadmissible. Uh, and that that could not be the basis for a motion for a new trial. The Eighth Circuit affirmed with the same reasoning. Uh, there is a circuit split as to whether uh, what goes on in deliberation, statements by jurors, uh, are absolutely barred from being considered later for a motion for a new trial, or whether in some circumstances uh, they can form the basis as far as improprieties of statements made during deliberations as a basis for a new trial. Uh, the court accepted the, this case for review, uh, probably because of the circuit split. And uh, the narrow issue in the case 
is an application of a particular federal rule of evidence, uh, 606B. Federal rule of evidence 606B says statements of uh, jurors during deliberations uh, shall not be received after verdict uh, in support of a motion for a new trial. It contains a couple of narrow exceptions, and the one here that the plaintiffs say should apply is that you can present the evidence if there's extraneous prejudicial information involved. The plaintiffs uh, argue that the extraneous prejudicial information is Mrs. Whipple, the four person's story about her daughter. The opposing view is that the word extraneous means some outside influence, not what is being told by a juror based on personal experience, but some outside influence like a newspaper article or a, a television show or something else about the case that was not part of the evidence in the case. Um, and it will be interesting to see whether the court takes uh, basically an absolutist view concerning this rule and this situation and narrowly construes the word prejudicial or allows this case to proceed to a hearing on a motion for a new trial. So let's see. Again, I'm inviting questions through the Q&A box on your screen, and I've got one here for Professor Sosnoff. Are there any situations where the Constitution may come into play or dictate the result? I think that that is uh, possible, that uh, even if the, uh, the defense prevails here and is under the rule, this is not considered to be extraneous prejudicial information, uh, I would hope personally and there is support in language in some lower court opinions, that if, for example, you had a situation where what was shown was that during deliberations, jurors were making racially prejudiced remarks, for example. Like, we know how black people are, so this defendant is probably guilty because these young black guys, they go around robbing people, so he's probably guilty. Remarks like that, and I'm not making up those kind of remarks, there's cases where they've, it's been shown they actually were made during deliberation. You would hope there that at least uh, the Constitution would step in or you're an equal protection or due process grounds to say that in that situation, the verdict, there has to be a hearing as to whether this information, as to whether these statements were made, and that there should be a new trial if they're showing of racial discrimination or ethnic discrimination during del deliberation. So what do you think is going to happen here? I think most likely the court will interpret it narrowly and the defense will win as far as the rules concerned because I think the court's going to be reluctant. Of course, what do I know? It's just a guess. But I would say that uh, the court's probably going to interpret it narrowly to be only outside influences like newspaper reports and television about the case because they're going to view it as a slippery slope as to considering uh, various statements that people make during deliberations, that, that, that in general they're going to want to preserve the, uh, uh, the secrecy of deliberations and not open up what they might fear as a Pandora's box of motions based on what jurors say during discourse uh, involving uh, a decision on a, on a verdict. So that's my best guess, particularly since there's a prior case uh, which had a different issue, but uh, the court uh, ruled in favor of not allowing a hearing or a new trial where it was shown that jurors were partying throughout the trial very heavily. Uh, a number of them were drunk. A number of them were high on marijuana. At least one was high on cocaine. And all this, the United States Supreme Court ruled, could not be the subject of a post-verdict hearing to get a new trial. Thank you. We appreciate your contribution. Mm -hmm. Welcome. All right. Next up, we have Professor John Culhane. He is back to discuss gay marriage with us today. And this has gotten so much attention nationally, we really felt it should be on the agenda. Um, Professor Culhane has done an incredible amount of writing and commenting on this topic, given his expertise in the legal rights of same-sex couples. So I'm hoping you can fill us in a little bit on what's going on in the circuits, and do you see this issue possibly coming back before the court this term? 
I think it will. And in fact, I'm following several cases that the Supreme Court is currently considering for review, although they haven't taken cert on any of the cases uh, thus far. All of the cases involve the issue of marriage equality for gay and lesbian couples. And the cases are conferenced, the cases I will be discussing are conferenced for the 29th of September, and it's possible we could know that very same day which, if any of, the, of these cases, the court will take for uh, cert. So I want to spend some time putting the cases in context. How did we get to this point? Then I want to talk a little bit about the cases themselves and then explain why this issue still matters for local media, given that all of the nearby states uh, uh, recognize marriage equality already. I still think this is important. So first, the context. In June of last year, the Supreme Court decided United States against Windsor. And in that case, the court threw out a provision of the Defense of Marriage Act which was a federal law that said even if a couple was validly married in their home state, their marriages would not be recognized under federal law. And in a five to four decision, the court declared this provision unconstitutional. Unfortunately, the court's reasoning in, in reaching its holding was a little bit unclear, and that lack of clarity could be important as we move forward. So in the first half of the Windsor decision, the court really spent some time digging into how odd it was for Congress to be mucking around in marriage law, right? Passing a law that decides that marriage doesn't count for federal purposes, even if it counts for state purposes. Uh, and that that was historically a matter for the states. So it seemed like the court was moving toward declaring that the Defense of Marriage Act violated principles of federalism, which basically say, you know, Congress has a limited grant of authority and it doesn't include uh, mucking around in marriage. But then, all of a sudden, about halfway through the opinion, the court uh, pivoted and said that the reason that this mucking around in state law violated the Constitution was not because of federalism, but because such an odd incursion into what's usually a state prerogative, who gets to be married, was really a sign that the law was passed out of ill will, what the court calls animus toward gay and lesbian couples. And once the court found that the animus was a re the real reason for the law, it was kind of a short step uh, to finding that Congress had really been acting to strip same-sex couples and their children of dignity and uh, equality, and that therefore the Defense of Marriage Act violated the liberty interests that the Constitution protects under the Fifth Amendment. Uh, before the ink was dry on Windsor, I know that's a cliche, but it's almost literally true in this case, within weeks there were a flurry of lawsuits filed seeking declarations that state laws prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying were unconstitutional. And these suits uh, pitted really two possible readings of Windsor against each other. So the first is that the uh, a constitutional problem was with Congress passing such a law. Uh, and the second one uh, is that the case is really about dignity and equality. And therefore, it really doesn't matter that it was Congress doing the deprivation, at that a, a state law uh, doing the same thing would also be unconstitutional. Uh, so within a short time, there were lawsuits filed in every single state and Puerto Rico that still have anti-gay marriage laws on their books. And so far, the big winner in terms of this battle of interpretation has been the second interpretation, that the case really is about dignity and equality. There have been 39 wins for the couples challenging these suits and only two losses. In other words, almost all of the judges have found that the second reading of Windsor, that the case is really about dignity and equality, has been uh, more compelling. And so far, the case has gotten uh, decisions by three federal appellate courts. And all three of these have found that the marriage bans violate the Constitution. So there are cases from the Fourth Circuit, which is Virginia, two from the Seventh Circuit, Indiana and Wisconsin, and two from the Tenth Circuit. And a bunch from other circuit courts are working their way up. But these three provide plenty of material for the court. So the Fourth Circuit case is Rainey against Bostick, that involves a very broad Virginia law that bans not just same-sex marriage, but even civil unions and certain kinds of contractual agreements. The Seventh Circuit case was written by a very influential judge, Richard Posner, who emphasized the, uh, the equality issues. And the Tenth Circuit case, I think, might appeal to the Supreme Court. It was a two-to-one split, uh, and there was a spirited discussion about uh, what the court had decided in Windsor with the dissenting judge really thinking that the case was mostly about the power of uh, Congress having been exceeded. Uh, so the court is going to probably take one of these cases 
And in so doing, it's also going to likely resolve the question, how broad is the right to marry? Is it fundamental to same-sex couples as well as to opposite-sex couples, uh, or is it defined more narrowly? Uh, what's at stake locally? Uh, the whole Northeast at this point has uh, marriage equality, and there's no pending litigation, but local media covering Pennsylvania should keep an eye on the SCOTUS case anyway, not just because it has national significance, but more that a lower court uh, in, I think, April of this year found that the Pennsylvania gay marriage ban was unconstitutional, and the corporate administration uh, decided not to appeal, but that law is still on the books. So if the Supreme Court were to take one of these cases and decide that these marriage bans uh, were in fact constitutional, then the Pennsylvania law would be reanimated, and that would cause uh, lots of confusion. If this law is raised from the dead, uh, there would be confusion about the rights of married same-sex couples in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Sure. Professor, I'm, I'm curious. What, what do you think the likelihood is that the Supreme Court will answer the question about gay marriage this term? Uh, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 100%. I think uh, we're going to have a couple of more decisions from circuit courts very soon. Uh, there are judges, even though we don't have a split in the circuits yet, I think one is coming. I think there's a Fifth Circuit case that's likely to go the other way, and perhaps a Sixth Circuit case that's sort of on the fence. The, the court, I think, needs to resolve this quickly because the status of couples as they move from state to state is unclear. Uh, and it seems like this national conversation about marriage has been going on for so long that I think the court is ready. And I expect that even if they don't decide to take the case in their September 29th conference and they push it back for a few weeks, I think that by the end of October, the court will have decided to take the case. And if that's so, we should know the answer by June of next year. Much. Sure. appreciate you being with us this morning. And now I'm turning my attention to Professor Bruce Groskall. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the preview program today. Professor Groskall just joined our faculty this summer, and we are so pleased to have him here at Widener Law, Delaware. You're going to be talking about a bankruptcy case today, which is fitting, since you are our new Helen S. Balick, Visiting Professor of Business Bankruptcy Law. Wellness International... Network Limited v. Sharif, is that what you're talking about? That's right, Mary. All right, go ahead, thanks. And, and it's my, my great pleasure to uh, participate today, uh, and it is a privilege uh, to join the faculty, uh, as well as to have my name associated with uh, Judge Balix. And thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, in, in recent years, the Supreme Court has wrestled with um, the fundamental basis of the bankruptcy courts, which is their jurisdiction and authority uh, to decide cases and resolve debtors' estates. Uh, in Wellness International versus Sharif, uh, the Supreme Court uh, certified two questions uh, for its consideration. And each of these go to the heart of the jurisdiction and the authority of the bankruptcy judges to decide bankruptcy cases and resolve debtors' estates. And those questions are first, uh, whether the bankruptcy court has the constitutional authority uh, to enter a final order deciding an action brought, by a, uh, brought against a debtor to determine whether property in that debtor's possession is property of the bankruptcy estate when the determination of that action uh, depends in part on a state property law issue. The second question is whether, the, whether Article Three of the United States Constitution, which is the article that deals with the judiciary, uh, permits the exercise of the judicial power of the United States by the bankruptcy courts on the basis of litigant consent such as the filing by a debtor of a voluntary bankruptcy petition, uh, and, and if so, whether implied consent um, is sufficient to satisfy Article III. Um, while these questions appear to be somewhat esoteric, they really go to the very heart of the bankruptcy court's jurisdiction and authority uh, to enter final orders. Uh, a bankruptcy proceeding essentially consists of two parts. The first is the creation of a bankruptcy estate uh, which arises on the filing of the petition uh, and consists of the debtor's property that existed at that time. And the second is the payment to creditors uh, on, from the value of that estate uh, to the extent that there are allowed claims and to the extent that there is uh, value to do so. Federal law, specifically Section 541 of the Bankruptcy Code, uh, defines what constitutes property of the estate. And bankruptcy judges routinely decide these questions. The key issue in the wellness 
uh, case is the constitutional limit on the bankruptcy judge's authority, uh, which is given by the statute. Um, and the constitutional limitation arises from the fact that bankruptcy judges are not lifetime tenured judges under Article Three of the Constitution, but have 14-year terms. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court has addressed that issue twice recently, once in the case of Stern v. Marshall, and more recently in a case called Bellingham. Um, the congressional authority given to bankruptcy judges includes um, the authority to enter final orders on core proceedings, which include many aspects of property of the estate, including turnover of property of the estate, the use and sale of property of the estate, and other matters concerning the administration of the estate. Uh, the court in Stern held that though bankruptcy judges may have statutory authority, in many cases they don't have constitutional authority because, uh, because they're not lifetime tenured. In wellness uh, versus Sharif, which the Supreme Court will consider this term, uh, the, the Seventh Circuit held that the bankruptcy court lacked constitutional authority uh, to determine whether purported trust assets in a trust allegedly controlled by Mr. Sharif, who filed the bankruptcy case, were property of the debtor's estate. The facts simply put are as follows. There was extensive litigation between Sharif and other plaintiffs against Wellness International. It resulted in a $650,000 uh, attorney's fee award in favor of Wellness against Sharif. Um, Sharif and the other plaintiffs ignored post-judgment discovery requests. Sharif was held in civil contempt, was arrested and released on his own recognizance. Two weeks later, Sharif filed his Chapter 7 petition in the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, Wellness filed a complaint in the bankruptcy case, arguing that uh, Mr. Sharif should be denied a discharge, uh, including because he concealed property and falsified uh, records. Wellness also sought a declaratory judgment uh, that the trust in which Sharif had allegedly, allegedly hidden his property, the Sowed Water Trust, of which he, of which he was the trustee, uh, was Sharif's alter ego and that its assets should be treated as property of Sharif's bankruptcy estate. Sharif, true to form, again failed to comply with discovery, uh, including a request for the production of documents regarding that trust and property that was transferred into it. The bankruptcy uh, judge entered a default judgment in Wellness's favor. The district court affirmed. On appeal, the Seventh Circuit disagreed, holding that Sharif, that, the, that Sharif's argument that under Stern, the bankruptcy court lacked constitutional uh, authority uh, was, uh, was the right answer. Um, the, seventh, the, the Seventh Circuit determined that the alter ego claim was a state law claim between private parties, uh, wholly independent of federal bankruptcy law. Uh, the Seventh Circuit also decided that the debtor could not waive, the, the debtor could not have waived his objection to constitutional authority to decide the alter ego claim, even by filing a voluntary bankruptcy case because such objection implicated separation of powers principles and was not waivable. Uh, it would appear that a good argument in favor of authority in this case uh, is that the definition of property of the state is in the bankruptcy code and is a matter of federal law. But in recent years, the Supreme Court has issued two opinions, at least prior to this one, indicating that it believes much of the authority given by Congress to bankruptcy judges who do not have lifetime tenure is constitutionally infirm. Whatever the answer, this, will, um, this, this case will have a significant bearing on bankruptcy uh, practice and procedure. Uh, if the bankruptcy judges cannot decide these cases, it will mean that United States district judges will have to decide very many uh, bankruptcy uh, matters, either de novo, or uh, upon proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law uh, issued by the bankruptcy courts. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. All right, so let's see. I'm looking through the questions here, and I've got one for you. Could the bankruptcy code be amended to resolve this issue regarding the constitutional authority of bankruptcy judges? Uh, very easily. Uh, it could be resolved simply by Congress uh, giving bankruptcy judges lifetime tenure. That would solve the whole problem. Um, and a whole lot of uh, excedrin headaches that uh, bankruptcy judges and bankruptcy lawyers have had lately. Okay. All right. Colin S. Bailick, visiting professor of business bankruptcy law, Bruce Rothschild. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so morning. much. It was a pleasure to participate. Thank you. Okay. All right. We've got two cases left. So next up is assistant professor Christine Alley.
She's here to present a case that could be of interest particularly to media in this part of the country. It's a case that comes to the High Court from the Maryland Court of Appeals, and it involves income taxes for people who work in one state but live in another, which actually happens all over the country, but, uh, but the case is coming from this area. The Maryland border is not far from our home here at Widener Law, Delaware, and from our campus in central Pennsylvania. So, Professor Alley, what can you tell us about Comptroller v. Wynn? Thanks, Mary. In this case, the Maryland State Comptroller of the Treasury has been granted cert to determine whether the Dormant Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution requires a state and its municipalities to grant an income tax credit on income earned in other states and which was paid taxes on in other states. The respondents here are Brian and Karen Wynn. Brian and Karen Wynn are, were residents of Howard County, Maryland in the 2006 filing year, and they filed a joint return, and they have five children uh, under that return. Brian Wynn held a 2.4% ownership in Maxim Healthcare Services Incorporated. Maxim is a Maryland subchapter S corporation. It's based in Howard County, Maryland, but it does business all over the country. It provides home health care, medical staffing, and other services nationwide. In that year, 2006, uh, Maxim provided services and paid taxes in 39 states outside of Maryland. A subchapter S corporation is a corporation that elects to pass through income, deductions, and losses, and credits to, through to their shareholders for tax purposes. Thus, Brian Wynn uh, reported income from his ownership in that business on his personal tax return. And that year in 2006, the Wins filed a joint tax return, uh, making, uh, putting Karen also on that return uh, that, that was in question. Maryland subjects its residents to both state income taxes and to local income taxes. We see this in a lot of different jurisdictions, for instance, in Delaware. Uh, Delaware assesses an income tax on its residents. Uh, and Wilmington City also assesses a, an additional income tax on its residents. Um, the state portion of the Maryland income tax allows for a credit against the taxes paid on income to other states. However, the local tax, municipal level tax, does not allow for such a credit. Such a credit was allowed in the past. Uh, in 1975, the Maryland legislature changed that and no longer allowed for such a credit. The state taxing power is generally recognized as a plenary power with regard to taxing one's own residence. Uh, you can tax your residence on income earned within the state, property held within the state, and also on income earned uh, outside of the state. A state's, tax powers, a state's powers to tax non-residents, though, is limited only to property owned within the state and on income derived from that property or on uh, business within the state. Therefore, then, if an individual is a resident of one state and engages in business in the second state, both the resident state and the state in which the individual conducts business have taxing authority over that same income. The argument which succeeded in the court below relies on the Dormant Commerce Clause, a derivation of the Commerce Clause found in Article I of our federal constitution. That clause, the Commerce Clause, allows that Congress may regulate commerce among the several states. The negative aspect of this clause, or the Dormant Commerce Clause, denies the states the power to unjustifiably, unjustifiably discriminate against or burden interstate flow of commerce. There's an implied limitation of power of the state and local governments to affect foreign interstate commerce. This provision is, is mostly focused on protection of the free market and to promote interstate commercial neutrality. The limitation of the credit for payments of out-of-state taxes to the state portion of the Maryland uh, income tax treats a Maryland resident who has substantial out-of-state earnings differently than a resident with only in-state earnings. This creates a disincentive for Maryland residents to do business and conduct, conduct income-generating uh, work in another state. Thus, it may affect interstate commerce. The WINS argument, then, is that the Dormant Commerce Clause of the Constitution requires Maryland to extend the credit to the municipal-level tax. Uh, in 1979, the U.S. Supreme Court Recognizes, recognize that taxes may be apportioned among taxing jurisdictions so that no instrumentality of commerce is subject to double taxation on income. The Maryland State Control of the Treasury, however, relied on that plenary power of the state to tax its residents on all income wherever derived. This, uh, 
this rule makes a sense for many different reasons. Uh, for instance, the winds are receiving the benefits of living in Howard County, Maryland. They're receiving educational and other social benefits, as well as, um, as protections from the state. These protections and other, other benefits are provided through the collection of this revenue. Um, if the case is determined in favor of the WINS presentation of the Dormant Commerce Clause, uh, this case could have far-reaching effects. Similar regimes in other states limit taxes, limit credits to taxes only paid in certain sister states. Additionally, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania have similar uh, provisions to the Maryland tax on municipal taxes. If the decision below stands, Maryland State Controller estimates that there will be a reduction between, of between 45 and 50 million annually in income tax collected in Maryland uh, and potentially $120 million of refund claims for the last few years. Professor Alley, thank you. So a question for you. The city of Wilmington imposes this local income tax on residents. Would that tax be affected by a ruling that Maryland's tax scheme is unconstitutional? It would, Mary. The city of Wilmington imposes a 1.25% tax on its residents and anyone doing business in the city of Wilmington. So they do allow for credit uh, if you are a resident and working in another jurisdiction that uh, does assess a municipal income tax against that income. The credit there was limited to only half of what you pay to that other jurisdiction. So if the wins case does succeed on their argument, then um, Wilmington would have to provide a full credit rather than just a half credit. So, wow, ramifications of this could be, be felt really right down at the very local level. Very local. Pennsylvania has a similar scheme to the Maryland scheme as well. So the tri-state area it will all be very much affected. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate you being here with us today. And give Professor Alley credit for reporting to, to duty here today right after teaching a full <laughs> class already this morning. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. All right. And now I'm moving over to our closer today. We have Associate Professor Mary Ellen Motman, who counts employment discrimination law among her areas of expertise. And she's got a really interesting case for us today involving UPS and one of its workers and what happened after that worker became pregnant. So Professor Motman, why don't you tell us about Young v. UPS? I'd be glad to do so. Thank you for inviting me today, Mary. This is a case about how to interpret one of the federal anti-discrimination laws. The law in question is called, generally called Title VII. Title VII has some basic prohibitions for employers. It says employers cannot discriminate against their employees on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, and sex. Now, Title VII was passed in 1964. And for a while, there was some debate about whether the prohibition against discrimination on the basis of sex included discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. After some debate back and forth in the courts, the Congress amended Title VII in the 1970s to make it clear that the word sex in Title VII includes pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. And the law they passed that made that clear is called the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, or the PDA. And the PDA gives that definition to Title VII's use of the word sex. But the PDA did something else. It also says that it only requires employers not to discriminate against women on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions if the pregnant woman is similar to other employees in her ability or inability to do work. Now fast forward to our case. Peggy Young, the plaintiff, was a driver for UPS. Her job involved driving a UPS truck to the airport and loading packages onto the truck. Some of those packages were light, some were heavy. Mostly they were light, but there were some heavier packages. As she worked for UPS, Ms. Young sought to become pregnant and did succeed in that and told her employer she was pregnant and had a doctor's note saying that she could only engage in light duty. Specifically, her do doctor did not want her lifting anything greater than 20 pounds. This had some implications for her lifting packages in her job. She asked for the light duty and UPS said no. It said, we don't have provisions for light duty for pregnant women and she eventually had to take unpaid leave. 
Young said that was discrimination because the collective bargaining agreement UPS had with its workers did permit light duty for three categories of employees. Those categories were employees with accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, employees who had been injured on the job, and employees who had lost their Department of Transportation certification to drive for an assortment of reasons. So she argued, I'm like those three categories of employees in my inability to do the work. And she argued, the PDA says, don't discriminate against people on the basis of pregnancy if they're similar to other employees in their inability to do the work. She did not succeed in this argument. The trial court found against her, and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed. They were persuaded by the UPS's argument that the policy was pregnancy blind because she wasn't in the three categories of employees covered by the collective bargaining agreement. The Fourth Circuit went so far as to say she was seeking what it called favored nation status or special treatment, one in light duty because she was pregnant. And the Fourth Circuit specified, along with UPS, that she didn't fall into any of the three categories in the UPS collective bargaining agreement. Pregnancy is not considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. She hadn't been injured on the job, and her problem was not a lost certification with the Department of Transportation. Therefore, looking at the case this way, she compared to employees who had been injured off the job. And under UPS's collective bargaining agreement, those employees were not eligible for light duty. The Supreme Court's going to hear the case in December. We only have Ms. Young's brief so far. The brief makes a straightforward argument that UPS's policy is facially discriminatory. On its face, treats her differently from the three categories of employees who are covered by the collective bargaining agreement. The strategy is to use a very straightforward statutory reading. And that might appeal to the court, because the court likes to use straightforward statutory reading for Title VII. I expect that UPS will continue to argue that its policy is sex and pregnancy blind, and to press its theory that she's seeking special treatment. That might appeal to the court because the court has never liked the idea of granting pregnancy or pregnant employees what it views as special treatment. So the case is going to turn on whether the court is willing to decide whether those categories of employees who get light duty are the appropriate comparators for Ms. Young, or if it agrees with UPS, the appropriate comparators are um, just solely the people in those job categories. I should note that a few states and cities, including New Jersey and Philadelphia, do have laws requiring some accommodations for pregnant workers unless the employer can demonstrate an undue hardship. But until the court decides this case, it is not clear whether employees outside of those jurisdictions have any right to ask for light duty. Okay. So I'm curious, if an employer gives light duty to a man who breaks his leg on the job, why not require the employer to do so for Ms. Young? Well, in Ms. Young's view, that would be you know, the question to ask, the fairness question to ask. UPS would say, we are being fair. Fairness under Trial 7, according to UPS, is treating like people alike. And it treats her like anyone else disabled because, she, because they were injured off the job. And UPS would say, if a man injures his leg or breaks his leg off the job, he's not going to get light duty either. The problem for Ms. Young and for pregnant women is that you're never going to get pregnant on the job. It's always going to be an off-the-job condition. So the collective bargaining agreements crafted in the way that the UPS agreement was, which by the way is very common, will never cover pregnant women and they are going to be caught in this position of not being eligible for light duty while there are categories of workers who are eligible for light duty. Okay. Thank you, Professor Martin. My pleasure. All right. Well, I'd like to thank our faculty for sharing their knowledge of the law and our audience for listening today and members of our audiovisual staff for helping us bring this program to you today. We hope you enjoyed it. And once again, we did record it. It will be posted on the Law School website and we will send out links via Facebook and Twitter when we get it up there. Thanks for watching and have a happy Constitution Day.